Okay, so we are back and we have started the study of first order logic. We got an overview in the last session and now as is becoming our practice, we start by defining the language. Remember that a logic language is a formal language and we start by defining the syntax of the language. Then we will talk about what are the sentences of the language. Then we will talk about what is the meaning of those sentences and also we will talk about how to arrive at truth values of sentences. So, all that will happen, but we start with syntax. Like in propositional logic, there is going to be a logical part of the vocabulary which is kind of constant and it is not does not depend upon which domain you are talking about. And it is very similar to what was there in uh, propositional logic. We have a set of connectives or operators. So, our old friends and or not implication, we have a set of brackets and so on. But in first order logic, there are more things which are also part of the logical uh, vocabulary. Mm. Of course, constant symbols like top and bottom, if you remember, they were part of proportional logic also as well. They are part of this logic as well. Apart from that, we have a set of variable symbols which we will we will call this set V and basically it is got a set of symbols and each of them we will say is a variable symbol essentially. So, we can say V 1, V 2, V 3 or you can say X, Y, Z or X 1, Y 1, Z 1 and so on essentially. So, these variable symbols will be used to stand for those individuals who have we have not identified and it has two new symbols. These are called quantifiers. We will look at them in some detail. The first one is called the universal quantifier and it is normally read as for all. So, if you want to say all men are mortal, then you would use the universal quantifier. The other one is written like a left side right E and it is read as there exists and it is called an existential quantifier. So, if I say for example, there exists an even number, then I would use this quantifier to make that statement. So, I am saying that there is at least one even number in my domain essentially. Sometimes we introduce a special symbol in logic which is the equality symbol which of course, all of us are familiar with because we do arithmetic and algebra all the time and it is read as equals. But when we do add this symbol and we will see that it has certain special properties that give us certain deductive abilities uh, which come from those special properties of equality. So, for example, it is symmetric and transitive and reflexive and so on which we can exploit as you will see when we look at theorem proving in first order logic. Uh, so, sometimes we say we have first order logic and sometimes we say we have first order logic with equality which means we have added this extra symbol and along with that the properties of those symbols essentially. Then as we said earlier, uh, for every logic we have to have a uh, non-logical part or the domain specific part. Uh, and in first order logic, the vocabulary for the domain specific part constitutes of three sets. So, if you compare this with propositional logic, in propositional logic we said we have a set of propositional symbols uh, P 1, P 2, P 3 or P Q R. Here we are saying that we have three other sets and they are as follows. A set of predicate symbols, we will call this set P. Some books call this R because predicates and relations are intricately connected to each other, but it does not matter. We can we will call it P here, a set of predicate symbols and it is just a set of symbols and typically we may say P 1, P 2, P 3 and P Q R and so on. This looks very much like the propositions in, in propositional logic, but remember we are defining a new language here. These are not propositions, these are predicate symbols essentially. More commonly as we have been doing, we will use symbols like man, mortal, greater than. 
Remember again that these are just symbols essentially, they stand for, they are part of the alphabet of first order logic. The fact that we have used the symbol man does not mean that we are talking about humans, it is just a symbol, just keep that in mind. But because we often tend to use variable names uh, which are meaningful to us and which is what we intend to them to stand for, we often use these symbols. But as far as the machine is concerned, this is just a symbol essentially, I could have jolly well written P there essentially or any any symbol. And, and for all you know this man could have sta stood for something like uh, let us say a horse essentially, what our conceptually we call a horse. I might have given this that it's this symbol of man will define the set of horses essentially. Anyway, so that that comes later, but obviously we don't do that kind of you know things which will confuse the hell out of us. Uh, we would read, we will use a symbol man when we intend to talk about men. So this is a set of predicate symbols. Then we have a set of function symbols essentially. Predicate symbols will stand for relations between things. Uh, so, we said for example, teacher or something like that or pet essentially. Function symbols will stand for functions in the domain. What do we mean by functions? Functions are mappings which in the simplest case take some individual or another individual and map it to something else essentially. So, these are function symbols, we will look at them, we will look at the semantics and syntax in detail. Commonly, commonly we will use function symbols like f1, f2, f3 or f, g and h, but more often than not because to make life easier for ourselves, we might use the term successor. So, successor is a function, supposing you are talking about numbers, successor is a function. Uh, the successor of 2 is 3, the successor of 3 is 4 and so on and so forth. Likewise, sum is a function. We will define sum as a binary function, it will take two inputs and give us one output essentially. Each functional symbol has an arity, just like each proposition symbol, each predicate symbol also should have an arity. That means how many arguments they take essentially and we will see the syntax as we go along. But I am sure we are all of us are familiar with this essentially. The third set is a set of constant symbols. These are symbols which stand for known individuals in the domain essentially. Typically in a formal sense we might use C1, C2, C3 or sometimes A, B, C and so on, but more often we would use symbols like 0. So, we know that the 0 we want it to stand for the number 0. Socrates is the symbol that we want to stand for that individual who we are calling Socrates. Darjeeling is a symbol for the city in India which we, we, we call Darjeeling and so on essentially. The three sets together define a language. So, the language is made up of these three sets, the set of proposition sim predicate symbols, the set of function symbols and the set of constant symbols or some, some books might write. Uh, RFC, the set of relation symbols, function symbols and constant symbols. So, that is all vocabulary. Now, to talk about how do we build sentences using this vocabulary. Before we build sentences, we build something called terms. So, there is a as some logic books will say, there is a family of terms or there is a set of terms. The basic constituents of FOL expressions are terms essentially, the constituents essentially. The set of terms which we will use this T like symbol here of this language is defined as follows. First of all, the constants and the variables are terms. So, that should give us a hint that when we say terms, we are talking about individuals essentially. So, constants are individuals that we know that are known, variables are individuals that are not known essentially but basically they are terms which means they will refer to some element in the domain. Then more terms are defined using the function symbols. So, formally we say that if, if t belongs to uh, the set of variables, then t should belong to the set of terms essentially. So, all variables are terms, we just said that. 
if t belongs to the set of constants it belongs to the set of terms then if there are n terms t1 t2 up to tn so they are all terms that we have said here they belong to this set and we have a function symbol which belongs to the set of function symbols and it's an n place function symbol that means it will take n arguments then this expression where f followed by a bracket followed by those n terms followed by a closing bracket that is also a term essentially and therefore it belongs to the set of terms so these are the terms of the language and intuitively uh, informally terms will stand for individuals in the domain essentially so for example amongst humans uh, mother is a term uh, mother is a function and and mother of x is a is the mother of x it's it refers to a specific individual you see but if we said brother of x then brother is not a function whereas brother would be a relation essentially uh, why is that because it's not a uni there's no mapping from every x to that x is brother because for example x may have three brothers essentially so so x would be a relation so we would say something like uh, as we will see shortly atomic formula that brother suresh ramesh is a formula essentially whereas functions basically take some terms as input and map onto some new term essentially so if i say for example my function symbol is plus if i write it like this then if i say 7 and i say 13 here then it's a term essentially why because its two arguments are t1 and t2 t1 is 7 t2 is 13 the function name is plus and this is the way we write terms in logic the function name followed by bracket followed by the parameters followed by a close closing bracket so this stands for a term for for a, for an individual what is the individual we know that is is 20 essentially so terms stand for individuals now we come to formulas formulas are of our interest to us right because a logic is a set of sentences and sentences are something which can be true or false and we are heading towards that see terms cannot be true or false seven cannot be true or false or something like that you know or seven plus 13 cannot be true or false they are just in elements of the domain we are heading now towards things which are can be true or false so first we'll define the atomic formulas in propositional calculus the atomic formulas were the proposition symbols and then we apply the logical connectives something similar will happen here but first we need to define the atomic formulas for first order logic so the set of formulas is defined using terms and predicate symbols okay so those will be the constituents of defining atomic formulas by default the logical symbols bottom and top are also formulas that was the case in proposition logic as well now the set of well formed formulas f we will call this set f is defined as follows first we define the set of atomic formulas as we said bottom and top are atomic formulas then there are two more kinds of atomic formulas one is that if we have two terms t1 and t2 they are terms that's what we have written here then you take a opening bracket write the first term and put the equality sign in between and write the second term this is the atomic formula t1 equal to t2 it's a formula it's going to be true or false so if i say 3 equal to 7 you will immediately tell me it's not true but it has a truth value that's the important thing so that's one kind of atomic formulas and they will occur in the fol with equality if you don't have the equal symbol then of course we won't have these kind of formulas the other kind of term which is a more common kind of term is again as follows that if we have n terms t1 up to tn they are terms they belong to the set of terms and there is a predicate symbol p which belongs to the set of relation symbols or predicate symbols and it's an n place predicate symbol then we use that p and again 
we start the op opening bracket, list the n terms, close the bracket and now we have another atomic formula essentially. So, these are the two kind of atomic formulas apart from bottom and top. One is when two terms become equal T 1 equal to T 2, the other is when there is a predicate symbol which takes an appropriate number of arguments and constructs the simplest form of sentence which is called an atomic sentence or atomic formula. We will see there is a slight distinction between sentence and formula in first order logic, uh, but we will come to that essentially. So, now we have atomic formulas. The rest at least to some extent is like is the case in propositional logic. We use logical connectives to construct more formulas once we have some set of formulas. So, we have atomic formulas. We will say all the atomic formulas are formulas to start with and then we will keep using logical connectives to construct more and more formulas. So, the set of formulas of so here I use the symbol f here is defined as follows. If, if it if alpha is an atomic formula then it is a formula. This is what we did in proportional logic as well and like in proportional logic uh, if alpha is a formula then not of alpha is also a formula. So, I think we, we have decided to use this not symbol. So, I will change that and likewise for and and or and implies that these are for binary connectives and that is for the unary connective. So, that is something that we are already familiar with. You give us two formulas, give us a binary connective, we will put it together by saying bracket first formula connective second formula close bracket and we have a new formula. What about those other things that we mentioned? the quantifiers essentially. So, let us look at that. If alpha is a formula, if alpha belongs to f and x is a variable, then for all x alpha is a formula. Now, notice that we are not saying anything about alpha at all. Alpha can be any formula, x can be any variable but once we put it together this sequence of symbols for all sign the variable name and then bracket open and the formula. The formula can be a compound formula it can contain anything then that itself is a new formula essentially and this will be read as for all x alpha essentially where alpha is the formula that is the input to this. So, here is a true formula which I could write for I would say something like uh, for all x for all n let us say n is a variable let us say n is greater than n minus 1. Okay, I am mixing up terminology here uh, this is a predicate symbol, but when we talk about arithmetic we often use it in the infix format. I could have written like this. Let us say if g t stands for greater than n n minus 1, it would be the same thing essentially. So, hopefully there will not be confusion between that, but it is a formula which uses a variable n. It uses a function minus 1 also if you notice here or minus and it gives us a new formula essentially. Likewise, we can use uh, the other quantifier which is called as the existential quantifier and so if we construct this thing we use this quantifier then a variable name and then a formula in brackets then we have a new formula and this will be read as there exists an x such that alpha is true essentially. Now, this mathematical notion, notation is nice and it looks elegant and all, but if you intend to write programs to do logical deduction and logical reasoning, it is not so easy to handle with that and you will end up using some names and so on. And what uh, these two authors Charniak and McDermott, they wrote this book in I think 1986 or something, quite a nice book. Uh, they introduced this notion 
which does not use mathematical symbols at all. So, it, it use they use this list like notation and in those days in the 80s uh, this language called lisp was very popular. So, this list stands for list and p stands for processing. And many people said that Lisp is the language for AI and so on, but somehow it was never standardized and you know it kind of little bit went out of fashion, though there are still people who use Lisp, uh, especially in high, high kind of scientific enterprises uh, like NASA for example. Uh, but what this Lisp language used was a list structure, so everything was expressed as a list in, a, in, in the Lisp language. So, this expression is a list as you can see this has three elements one is for all symbol then it has got a sub list in some sense which has only one element and another sub list which has got some formula alpha the alpha itself will be in some list notation and so on. So, if you intend to write programs perhaps it makes sense to get used to this kind of representation essentially. Okay, so, here we are. Uh, in standard mathematical notation you would say all men are human beings for all x man x implies human beings human x essentially. So, if you were to write mortal x here then we would get our old formula all men are mortal essentially. If you write uh, Suresh is rich or happy which is a short form for saying Suresh is rich or Suresh is happy. So, this one says Suresh is rich, rich, this one says Suresh is happy. So, it belongs to the set of rich people, it belongs to the set of happy people. So, he belongs to one of these two sets and that is why it could well belong to both also because this is an inclusive war. That is how we would express it essentially. All citrus fruits are non-human so which we know is true of course and interestingly this statement some men are bright essentially this particular aff affirmative as Aristotle called it is used with a and sign. You need to think about that and maybe at some later point we will discuss this as to why that is the case. When we talk about manipulating symbols we will see that it makes sense to do that. So, this is the standard mathematical notations which logicians have been use, using since ages. If you want to write programs you could use Starniak and McDermott's uh, uh, notation and for the same formulas this is the notation in um, that list that list notation essentially okay, in which we do not use this mathematical symbols and connectives and things like that. Everything is just characters from the set A to Z. So, you can see that man x and bright x is in the infix form there whereas, in their notation and comes first and then the two arguments. This is a this can also be extended to three arguments for example, if you wanted to say it would be quite easier of course, you can extend the mathematical notation also to three arguments. This implication sign is written as if then the if part followed by the then part. The if part is citrus fruit x and the then part is human x. Human x is also written in the list notation. So, the first element of a list is the predicate name or the function name as the case may be or the connective and then the arguments follow essentially. So, it has a very uniform standard notation. Let us now define the sentences of this language. A variable within the scope of a quantifier. So, the scope of a quantifier is what follows that right. So, we said for all x then whatever we write in these brackets is the scope of the quantifier essentially. So, if there is a variable which is in the scope. So, if there is a variable x inside this brackets then we say that, that x is bound by the quantifier for all x essentially. If a variable is not bound 
then it is free essentially. So, we have two kinds of variables bound variables and free variables. The quantifier can be either universal quantifier or existential quantifier. Here is an example. Uh, some sentence I have written. for all x, this part and this part. The and is written before as we saw in this notation. So, we have two variables here x and y. The scope of this y exists y is only this much. That is where the bracket ends. So, those red brackets that I have drawn, they end there. So, this, this occurrence of y this the first occurrence of y is in the scope of the quantifier. So, that is bound essentially. This occurrence of x is also in the scope of this quantifier because it comes within that bracket the whole the whole bracket goes like this. So, this x and this y is bound, but this other occurrence of y is free essentially because it does not come in the scope of the quantifier. So, you need to just get this definitions right. Then we say that a formula. So, we have we decide we have seen how to construct formulas. You know? We start with atomic formulas, then we use logical connectives, then we use uh, uh, quantifiers and we get formulas well formed formulas according to the syntax that we have defined. Not all those formulas are sentences, only formulas without free variables are sentences. Why is that? Supposing I were to write this x less than 10, I could have written it as less than x 10, does not matter, they are the same different notations, but both of them are uh, formulas of the well defined formulas of the this thing. But these are not sentences, why? Because we cannot say whether they are true or false in principle also essentially, because we do not know what is x essentially. That is because x is free in this formula, x could take any value essentially. But if I were to add a quantifier, say for all x here, then it is no longer a free variable, it is bound by the quantifier. And what this quantifier is saying is that for every x that you can think of, the formula inside must be true essentially. But you know that that is not the case. For example, if x was to be 12, then it will not be true. So, which means, and we will see this formal definition of truth values in a moment, this whole formula will not be true. So, a sentence of first order logic is a well formed formula or a formula without any free variables, hmm? and that is the set we will work with essentially. So, we will stop here and come back and, and look at the semantics so, of uh, the language here. So, see you in the next session.